Because if you do right, you can't do wrong. A modern day leader, someone that can tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Coach Bill Courtney from the Oscar winning documentary Undefeated also wrote an amazing book called Against the Grain. I am I'm privileged, I'm honored to have this conversation, this interview. It changed my life. His book made me cry. The movie made me tear up. I'm telling you this, guys, not because I want to look like I'm just weeping all the time, but if somebody is out there doing the right thing, it's so inspirational, it's so motivating to me that I want to I want to do good. I don't want to do wrong. I want to do right. So that's what he taught me, and this interview is going to lead you to that. Get the book. Share the book. This is how we're going to start these movements. This is how we're going to change the world by all coming together creating new ideas, new concepts, and simplifying it down so we can implement this. So enjoy. This is fascinating. This is something I'm obsessed about. I think you're going to love it. Sorry about that. How you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, fantastic. I just actually got off the line with Hunter Motts. You were on the Brian Callum podcast. Uh, that's yeah. where I first got turned on to you. And I have to say, I haven't cried in a long time. And your book was beyond beyond inspirational beyond motivational but it touched me well thank you have you seen undefeated before i just watched it <laughs> i could not even, I actually, so you went you went book first then undefeated i did wow that's that's weird that's you may be one of the first i've heard of that's done that good i'm glad you did it that way well you you, you got to understand hunter Motts is uh, when he when he names a book out there uh it's it a lot of people are going to listen um, can I call you coach first off? I feel like you're my you coach. Call me, you can call me anything you want to, brother. I, I feel like I've had this obsession where I want to actually change the world and, and enrich the world and, and make it better, but it seems so big. It seems so impossible. And you're the first person that said, this is simple. It is simple. I, I just have to, if I'm doing right, uh, then everything's going to be right. I'm going to feel good about that. And if I'm doing wrong, it's going to be wrong. Could you elaborate on that idea for people that haven't heard that concept? You, you, it's fantastic. Well, sure. I mean, in, in against the grain, um, you know, one, one of my basic rules was do right. And it's, it's really that simple. And, you know, I, I'm a Christian, but you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to have a faith. You don't have to have anything to adhere to one principle that's do right. I, th I think we, I think, I think everybody has an internal voice that tells them if they're doing right or doing wrong. And the beauty, beauty about doing right is as a coach, you know, I don't have to list out 50 different rules to put on a wall that no kid can remember. And mm -hmm. I've got 120 employees and as a business owner, I don't have to list out 150 rules that nobody can remember all of them. Um, as a father, I don't have to do it. It's, it's very simple. Do right. Because if you do right, you can't do wrong. And, and then the flip side to that is when, you, um, when you're holding those that you have to hold accountable, it's a very simple question. Was that right? No. Well, then it was wrong. Yes. So there's no justification. There's no rationalization. There's no gray area do right and don't do wrong and and that's where a lot of it starts and and a lot of people think well that's oversimplified kind of idealistic mumbo jumbo but the truth is when we've got a government spending millions of dollars trying to quote do things right and political correctness and confusing very confusing messages from quote our, our leaders our politicians many times our bosses our coaches, I think you can you can get rid of all the gray area by just simply adhering to one simple principle: do right. And we all know what right is. Uh, if that is that is absolutely changing. If everybody's decision making was based on "Am I doing right?", uh, the world would change, and it would change. It absolutely would change. And you started this by saying, you know, you you want to make the world a better place, and it's so big, and. I like to take kind of complex issues and make them simple. And, and here's the thing. 
you can serve and get out of your comfort zone and leave without ever leaving the bedroom. You can do it with the kids down the hallway. You can do it with the guy in the next cubicle. You can do it with, with the two or three buddies you go have a beer with. And that's very small. That's, 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 that's not a big world. Those are, those are the people closest to you, and that's the easiest place to start. But can you fathom what the world would look like if everyone served, got out of their comfort zone, and led the people that I just said that you could do that with in your small world? If everybody did that and everybody did right, so much of what is ailing this country and so much of the divisiveness and so much of what is wrong and miserable in our lives would go away very, very quickly. I feel, I feel exactly the same way as it, it brings me back to, I, I, I actually hadn't had faith. Uh, this, this book rekindled my, my faith. I feel like faith and the expectation that this is actually leaving a legacy that it's, um, it's something that is important. It's more important than uh, anything else you could possibly have. So I, I, I thank you for that. And you, you say your word is ultimately what you only oh, – you, I know you've probably said this a million times as a coach, I'm sure, but your word is the only thing you're left with. Well, uh, and, and I describe it this way in, in Against the Grain, but you know I'll, I'll try to be concise on it. Um, for all of the people that are listening to this right now, if they would just close their eyes for just a second. I know it's kind of weird, but you know, I'm not going to do anything goofy here. Just kind of close your eyes and get to yourself. And I want you to think about your home, uh, your car, your most valuable possessions, uh, the things you've worked your whole life for, and think about how hard you've worked for those. And Think about the insurance you pay on them and, 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 and the difficulties you've had in attaining those things. And then recognize that right now, that could be being stolen, that could be burned, burned to the ground, they could be being destroyed. And despite all the false assurances of security systems and insurances, the truth is you have very little control over all that stuff. It could be taken from you, it could be burned down, the people most close to you could be murdered or, or, or be in a, in, a, in a horrible wreck right now and die. Mm -hmm. And there's truly, despite life insurance and, and all of the things we do to give ourselves a false sense of security, all of those things are in peril on a daily basis. There's really no control we have over all of that stuff. And you need to understand that that's just a fact, and it's a fact of life we live with. But there is, and so we don't have control over really much of anything, ultimate control, except for one thing. There's absolutely one thing that nobody can take from us, nobody can burn down, nobody can, can steal from us, nobody can destroy except ourselves, and that's our word. And when that is the only thing we truly have 100% absolute total control over is our word and our commitment, it is, it is disturbing to me how so ca how so cavalierly people approach their own word when it's the one thing we do have control over and i think the one thing that you've been given control over in your life is the one thing you should protect with everything you have because it's the only thing you can protect and control and when you think of your word and your commitment in in that respect um you know I, my hope is that people would think that, yeah, I, I got to think about what comes out of my mouth and I got to do what I say I'm going to do. And when you do what you say you're going to do and protect your word with everything you are, people will come to recognize you're the type of person they can depend on and to believe in. And if you're a person that does right and, and tries hard not to do wrong and you're a person that keeps your word and keeps your commitments, you're the kind of person that people want to follow, people want to be around people want to emulate and people want to work with um, and people want to live with. So that that increases the, the power of your family and your business and your standing in society and, and how you would handle your politics. And again, if people would just think about these simple things and, and employ them in their life on a daily basis, just consider what the world would look like. Yeah, I, I think, well, and as you're saying those words, it's, it's, extremely motivational and it's like I want to go out in the streets and start uh
preaching this, and I wish we had. Uh, <laughs> well, please, uh, I do not. The one thing I work very hard in uh, in the book um, to do, I don't want to come off preachy because no. I am failed and fallen, and I make mistakes every day, just like everybody else. I'm just trying to to kind of illustrate in against the grain some of these fundamental principles that if we would work hard on um, that that we can all be better. But I, I think as you read it, I, I certainly admit my my own failings. Um, but I also say, you know, every day you wake up and you and you suck some air in your lungs and you look out the window and the sun's coming up. It's just another opportunity to go to go do these things and and just every day make things better. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, also there's you're everybody's human, but the quality of your problems it usually is kind of an indicator how well you're doing in life. So if you have good quality <laughs> problems, and I gotta that's, imagine that's probably true. That makes a lot of sense. Right, running that business, and most people just don't understand how difficult it is to run this business they look at you as the boss there's uh, animosity uh they they don't understand how much money it takes to run a business so the fact that you're still running the business which i love your your website by the way um thank you is incredible to me well i mean look i, I as you know from reading the book and for your listeners who haven't read it yet and I, I hope they will and i hope they'll watch undefeated to get an idea of what's going on but um, you, you know, my mom was married and divorced five times. Uh, my father left the home when I was four, and I had almost no relationship with him. My mom's fourth husband shot at me down a hallway, and I had to dive out of window to save myself. So, I mean, when I tell you I don't come from much money, I don't come from much money. Yeah. And in 2001, I started a business off my couch, and it now does about $45 million a year in sales, and it employs 120 people. We've got the office and manufacturing facility here in Memphis, but we've got an office in Shanghai, we've got an office in Ho Chi Minh and Surabaya, Indonesia, and um, I've been very blessed. Um, but I, I'm telling you, the same fundamental tenets, the 14 fundamental tenets that are outlined in Against the Grain that I that I say help coaches, that I say help, help fathers and mothers, that I say help friends and society and politics, are the exact same fundamentals I've used to, to grow this business. So you're, you're very right. It's very difficult to start a business. And, and the political atmosphere in D.C. makes it increasingly mm -hmm. difficult on guys like me to, to continue to make a payroll and, and keep quality insurance for my employees. And, 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 you know, profits are a necessary measure of any business's success. So you want to do all those things, but you have to show a profit or the bank's going to pull your credit line and then you, you're you broke and everybody loses their job. So, you know, there shouldn't be this thought that profits are evil or that American exceptionalism is over. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bunch of crap and that, mm -hmm. that stuff is spewed from people who don't understand what it takes to operate and run a business. Mm -hmm. But when... When you do all, all, when you do run a business and build a business on the on the fundamental tenets and principles that are in against the grain, you can attain um, that exceptionalism and you can attain those profits and that success. But you can also do it bringing all your employees along with you so that they share in that success and they share in in the, in the pride of the of the company and and you build it in the right way, no differently than you do a football team or your business or how we should be operating our politics. I think a lot of companies out there should distribute this book to the employees, to, to the leadership, because it's really gonna, it's gonna teach them and make them feel a lot better about building this company, the company doing well, because a lot of workers have the exact opposite mindset than uh, against the grain. They are not, uh, they're not happy the companies are doing well. They're not happy they're, they're, the company's making profit. And, and you take a lot of pride in employing people, which is giving somebody a way to feed themselves and, and giving them some purpose is just so empowering. Well, in one of the chapters in Against the Grain, it's called The Dignity of Hard Work. Um, I think um, an entitled attitude is a destructive attitude. Mm -hmm. And before I get attacked, Everybody needs to read the book because I, I, I don't talk about entitlements in terms of just 
the the entitlements that we think about the government entitlement programs food stamps ebt cards welfare all that i do talk about that but i also talk about the entitlement attitude of rich kids and how destructive it is i also talk about corporate entitlement and and how really revolting that is the point is entitlement runs rampant throughout all walks of our societal lives and and take away the fiscal side of it take away the monetary side of it for a second when when you when you have an entitlement culture you strip that culture of the dignity that you get from a hard day's work and that is one of my biggest problems with it is you know whether you're running a company, coaching a football team, running a business unit somewhere, operating a backhoe, driving a truck, you're a plumber, you're an electrician, it doesn't matter. When you get to wake up every morning and look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm going to go out and work hard today, and then you come home and you face your family at the end of the day, and you kick off your boots and you sit down in your chair and watch a little TV or sit down at the dinner table, you get to have the satisfaction of knowing that you earned what you got. And then you can look at your kids and say, you know, this is how you get it done, and I do it, and I'm an illustration of how and what success looks like at, at, at any level. And when you have the dignity of the day's hard work under your belt, you can prepare yourself from there to have the dignity in, in a lot of other aspects in your life. However, when when you don't have the dignity earned from, from, from a hard day's work, from earning what you've done, and, and you basically are, have this entitled attitude, you're always going to want more, you're always going to expect more, and you're always going to be empty. And many times you don't know where that emptiness comes from, and I'm telling you, it comes from not earning something. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an intrinsic value that you get from the dignity of a hard day's work and the, and the more entitled attitude we get in our society, the deeper we tear away that dignity of the individual, and it concerns me in a, in a large way. Uh, I, absolutely, that's fascinating. I, it's not only fascinating, but if you look at lottery winners, um, usually within a year, they've lost all the money, they're completely unhappy. Even if they have the money, they, they serve no purpose, and we're certainly not on this earth to just take it, it's it, the, 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 it's you know you've heard the money doesn't make happiness and some will reply well I don't I've never I rarely see a very happy completely broke person and I, I get it but to me it's not the money that really gives you the satisfaction the happiness it's the pursuit of it yes. it's the earning it it's the doing something with it that gives you the happiness and that gives you the satisfaction that gives you the dignity and so it doesn't matter if you make $50,000 a year, you make $5 million a year. And the guy who makes $5 million a year should not be ostracized because he's been exceptional. He mm -hmm. should be celebrated, Absolutely. provided that he's doing something right with that money and acting with uh, a acting in, in appreciation of the blessings of that. And the guy making forty or $50,000 a year shouldn't be looked at it as any less than the guy making $5 million a year. What should be celebrated is the is is the hard work that got them there, and the dignity that they're getting from earning their keep, and and I just feel like generation by generation we strip more and more in our society from having that dignity, and and it's it's destructive, and and I, I think I think people miss that point. Yeah, it, it'll cripple you. Being it will a, cripple you. Cripple it your, absolutely will. It's not helping. It is. It's hurting you ultimately. And imagine the illustration you're giving to those around you in terms of your children and your friends um, when you're in that place. It's just it's it's destructive. It truly is. Uh, I, I'm guessing because of what type of environment we live in, but we need politicians like you, Coach. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but, I, I, that is very kind and humbling, but trust me, I'm unelectable for two reasons. One, um, I answer every question I'm asked candidly, and that makes me a very poor politician. Yeah. And, and number two is, frankly, I think I'm like the vast majority of Americans, which is I'm extremely right of center fiscally. Um, I, 
I, I, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm very conservative when yeah. it comes to physical matters, but I'm certainly left of center socially. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think that leaves me no party. And, you know, I've said that a lot, and most people go, well, that's how I feel. And they may identify themselves as a Democrat or may identify themselves as a Republican, but they feel that way. And the truth is um, neither national platform currently really aligns itself with the vast majority of Americans, which is why we're so divided and which is why we're so unhappy with the 15 percent approval of Congress and a 38 percent approval of the White House, uh, there is no wonder why there's such disapproval and such discord and disdain for the people in D.C., because neither the platforms that those people in D.C. represent truly identify with the vast majority of Americans, which is physically right and socially left. The one thing that you have... The book, I think, is even more powerful uh, than becoming a politician because now you can – that can be brought into people's minds, their consciousness. And uh, the faster, hopefully, this society gets back on track, they'll understand that you become a politician, you're just going to do right. And a lot of these situ- – you're not doing it just for yourself. You're doing it for, for everybody, for the future. So, Well, I, you, you know, I'm glad you said that because, listen – Here's the here's the truth. My business does forty five million dollars a year in sales. Now I'm not independently wealthy. I'm still p- paying off a lot of initial debt to get this thing started fifteen years ago. And the more and more the the government puts on us, the 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 harder and harder it is to make money. But having said that, I've been blessed with a wonderful life. I've got four children, a beautiful wife. We live in a lovely home. My kids go to great schools. We take a couple of vacations every every year. So I'm not hurting by any means. Um, I'm not pulling the Hillary Clinton thing. I'm broke. I'm not. Um, I've been I've been very blessed. Um, and and the reason I'm saying that is, you know, I don't need to do. I speak all over the country. I don't need to do the speeches for the money. Mm-hmm. And I did not write this book to make a bunch of royalties. I could care less about that. Um, my business takes care of my family and me just fine. I wrote this book because I, I passionately believe that these 14 tenants that are in against the grain can make a difference in our in our businesses, in our society, in our family, and in our politics. And I don't have to be the moderator of the conversation. And, and truthfully, I don't even know if I'm qualified to be the moderator of a national conversation. But if, if the book could just get the conversation started – could get people talking around the dinner table and around the water cool and around the coffee pot and and just start talking about this stuff, um, then I'd consider success. And that's why I wrote it. I just want people to start having the conversation. You're an, uh, an incredible writer. And I did read a, a little bit. You, you've written some columns before. This is something you enjoy doing, writing? Yeah, I do. I, I wrote for... I wrote in college a little bit and did a few feature articles for the Daily Mississippian and um, had a couple of columns. I've done a couple of op-eds for Fox News, and yeah, I really enjoy it. So do you have another book in, in you? Ha! <laughs> well, this one's got – you guys got to go buy a bunch of copies we're, of this book. So another, publish, so another publisher says, yeah, we'll, we'll spend the money. Like, yeah, I actually do. Um, I do have some more thoughts, and I, I, I actually would like to, to go at it another time, but uh, the, the opportunity to do that it will be predicated completely upon how well Against the Grain does, so I'm hoping you can uh, motivate your listeners to jump on Amazon and, or go to their local bookstore and get a copy. Yeah, I, I highly recommend that. I don't know if they count... Uh, we have uh, obviously a large audio listeners, a lot of you know guys driving in trucks and uh, students. Uh, does the audio book get counted in that? Uh... Absolutely, okay. yeah. There's, yeah, it's on Kindle. It's a, it's in hardback right now. It's a national release. You can get it at any bookstore. It's you can go order it on Amazon right now, and the audio versions uh, there. And they hired a narrator for the audio version 
which I didn't know, and I called them and said, no, sir, yeah, I nobody's read this book. And so the audio version is actually, I, I did it, so it's in my voice as well. And if, if you like the speeches from Undefeated, you're going to love the audio book because I could just throw that thing on, and it feels like you're just coaching me uh, throughout <laughs> my day. I feel really motivated walking around. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, uh, tomorrow we're going to be speaking to uh, – Brian Bishop from uh, the Adam Carolla show and his thought process is identical uh, in a lot of these ways. And he cast a much larger net. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, hopefully you'll be getting a call from Adam Carolla show. I think that'll push. I, oh, I, 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 I've done, I've done Adam's show two or three times and just did it about three weeks ago for sure. Oh, fantastic. I got to go back. I'm sorry. I missed that. That's um, all right. No big deal. Well, listen guys, we, we're going to get all over this. So, what was it that made you want to be uh, so motivational? What At some point, you must have said, why am I even coaching football right now? This is just a boatload of issues that I'm going to have to solve. What was it? Well, it's not that I wanted to be motivational um, at all. Um, I, you know, I, I, when I graduated from college, I, I taught school and coached football for a living. Um, and I got married, started having kids, and... Um, frankly, the income just wasn't getting it. And so that's why I got into the private world, bounced around a few jobs, one thing led to another, and I started this company. But I continued to coach um, on a volunteer basis even after that. Then in 2001, when I started this business, I really needed to pour myself into it to make sure it was successful. And so I, I didn't coach for about three years. And then the opportunity just came to, to coach. Um, and the reason I went to Manassas, which the movie and Undefeated, um, the reason I went to Manassas was because um, it's uh, half a mile from my lumber plant and the, the time just worked. I could still mm-hmm. get everything done at work and, and get over there and coach. And it was just, you know, it was close. And, of course, when I got there in 2003, as a varsity football team, their previous 10 years record was seven wins and 92 losses, and they had 17 kids on the team. And then six years later is the movie that you've seen, Undefeated. Uh, we had 75 kids on the team, and we're 18 wins and two losses over the last two years. So the juxtaposition is while I was growing this business from scratch, while I was growing my family, uh, we also spent six and a half years over Manassas growing their football program. And, and the tenants that are against the grain are the tenants we employed in that football team and in my family and in this business. And the whole point of the book is to illustrate that these tenants work across all walks of your life. Yeah, I, uh, I teach kickboxing to uh, beginners, and, and this can be implemented in teaching kickboxing or if you're – doing absolutely anything you should be impl- implementing these ideas concepts especially it's when when things aren't going right when you get frustrated what are you going to do are you going to fold up or are you going to make this happen uh i'm using my own language there but that's where your character is revealed. oh but that that language is it you you nailed it that's the exact point is you know the the, the true measure of a person's character is measured how they handle their failures, not their success. I mean, anybody can be a champ when everything's going right. When your kids are doing well in school, when when business is making money, or when your job is going well, when you got no problems in your marriage, when when all's right with the world, you walk around with your chest out and, and a big smile on your face and have plenty of character. It's it's when the world hits you in the mouth that that your response to those challenges really emulate your character and, and you're right when 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 tough things are happening are you gonna bow up you're gonna wilt mm-hmm. and and the way you bow up or wilt a lot of people say well that's fine but i don't even know how to bow up well i'll tell you how to bow up you carry your life with civility with dignity of hard work with integrity with commitment understanding what perseverance and fortitude is and working on building a legacy and if and if you build those fundamentals and tenets that are against the grain into your life, then when the world hits you in your mouth, you have a foundation to fall back on in order to answer that call and show true character. And that's really the whole point. 
Do you, um, this is a personal issue, uh, personal question, uh, or not even personal, personal for me, but how, how do you deal with, with when your wife hits you in the mouth? You bring well, I, I've, I've got a bloody lip. No, no. Um, <laughs> you know, hopefully you, you keep that from ever happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, civility is chapter six, the search for civility. And it's defined as how we treat those we oppose says more about us than our own opinions do. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is you're always going to have disagreements and, and the people you're closest to are the people that you're most comfortable, um, dis- most comfortable talking about your disagreements with. Um, it, you know, if, if you just met a guy at a, at a dinner party or something and you don't agree with what he says, you're unlikely to call him down on it. Um, mm-hmm. But if it's your wife or your kids or your best friends and they say something, well, you feel comfortable with them and, and there's familiarity there. And so you'll call them down on disagreements long before you call down a, a stranger on a disagreement. Well, the way you have that disagreement is what matters the most. It's not the disagreement that matters. It's mm-hmm. the civility with which you approach that disagreement that matters. And you and your spouse are always going to have disagreements. You just are. You're different human beings and you do have different thoughts on different things. But your approach to that disagreement is what matters. It has to be civil and non threatening. And and this is your spouse, the person you're supposed to love mm-hmm. the most in the world. And it, and it just is amazing to me how the person that you're supposed to be connected to for the rest of your life and have the most love for in your life, you will attack in a disagreeing way in a, in a, with a fervor that you wouldn't even consider attacking a pure stranger with. Mm-hmm. That is so backwards. That should be the person you have the most non-threatening and most civil disagreements with in order to avoid the hit in the mouth. Um, so it's, it's, it's an approach. It's, it's a, it's a way of handling yourself, um, with those you're closest to. And without any obvious caveats, uh, and I, I've always thought about this, the divorce is never even, should never even be thought of. We're, we're, we're married, we're a family, we're a unit, um, without any extreme situations. With, 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 with the exception of... If there's abuse or infidelity, um, I I think there is a a reasonable, um, I I think, uh, I think infidelity or certainly abuse, um, uh, allows a reasonable expectation that a marriage could be terminated. What I get disgusted with is the, we've been married eight years. We've got a two year old, a four year old. The world's a little tough, and I just don't feel like I'm in love anymore. I think I want a divorce. I think that's a bunch of crap. Yeah, you know that is that is looking for a hole in the fence. That is a complete lack of keeping your word. That is a that is a that is an absolute cop out, sell out. The world's tough, and I'm going to run from it. Attitude. Now, with the 50 percent divorce rate in this country, there are people listening to you right now who probably don't like what I'm saying. Exactly. And all I have to say to that is, good. That's damn good. You shouldn't like what you're saying. And if you're one of those people, now, again, fidelity or abuse is a different deal. But if you're just in a marriage that you made a decision and a commitment to marriage and then brought children into this union that you created that they did not ask to be brought into, and you haven't been abused or you're not abusive and you haven't been unfaithful and, and, and your partner hadn't been unfaithful to you and you just decided you're out of love and it's not working anymore, that's on you. Toughen it up and make it better because you have zero right to break your commitment and you have zero right to change the lives of the children that were brought in to your idiocy. You need to grow up. What's your thoughts on children? I, I haven't had children yet. I'm nervous that I'm not going to be able to, uh, I don't know, just uh, be there at every single second, which I've, I shouldn't. I'm, I'm the person who probably can want be one of the best fathers. Do you think people should have a lot of kids? Should they consider, you know, having less kids? I- I, I think I think that completely depends on the individual. Um, we have four. 
Ours are 19, 18, 17, and 16. Nice. And I will tell you the most delicious, savory moments of my life have come as a result of my children. Yeah. And I, I would take two more. But here's the thing. I've been blessed enough to be able to afford them. Uh-huh. I've been blessed enough to be able to raise them. Um, I've been blessed enough that my wife is able to stay home and take care of them, and not every family and marriage can do that. And so I think the numbers of kids that you have depend on depend on your circumstances in life and your comfort level. And some people decide not to have children at all, and that's great because that's best for their own life. And I don't I don't think anybody should should have. I think that's a very personal a very personal decision, a personal issue, and nobody should should second that unless you have someone just having kids to have kids and they can't afford them and they're running around uneducated and and not fed well and all of that i mean that to me is is an atrocity and it, it, because it's unfair to the child yes um, but in, in terms of, you know, like you say, I, I'm, I'm worried about, listen, man, they don't come out with manuals and, and, a, and a lot of, and a lot of people think, well, I'm going to raise my kid this way. People need to understand the old nature versus nurture issue. Mm-hmm. I have four children that have had the same rules and have had the same influences in their life each, and they couldn't be four more distinct different human beings with different interests, different attitudes, different approaches. And you got to understand having a child is a lot like potluck. You're going to raise them and teach them the best you can, but they're going to have their own individuality. They're going to have their own, their own sense of self and don't fight it, celebrate it, nurture it, love it, and, 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 and be there to experience it. And, and to me, it can be, it should be, um, you know, the, the most fruitful blessing of your life. Mm, fantastic. We always ask this question. If you could give yourself advice so you can travel back in time and to a particularly hard point in your life, you know, maybe this is 15, 16, 12, 20, what would that advice be? Would you just hand them the book? Discover grace earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a, a large part of the things that I've done in my life that I wish I had not done um, come as a result of um, my own sense of inferiority and my own sense of anger mm. that stemmed basically from not having a father in my life. Um, again, mom married and divorced five times. I had men in uh, my life. My, my, my father had very little to do with me. And it, it made me wonder what was wrong with me. Why, why is it that my father didn't want to be with me? Why is it that, you know, why is it that, I, you know, and, and, and I did. I had, a, I had a lot of inferiority complex because of it and a lot of anger because of it. And, and it took me a long time into, into late into my 30s before I finally grasped that it wasn't ever me. It was his own problems and, and his own misgivings and and it took me a long time to get there and then once I got there and I understood that you know he was the lost hurt and soul that my life was full was I able to actually forgive mm-hmm. and once I was able to forgive and show grace then all of that burden of hate and anger and and inferiority and all of that stuff was lifted off of me and it made me a much freer, open, happier human being. I mean, back to make taking complex issues and making it simple, if you if you harbor ill will, if you if you have anger and you're and you're mad at somebody, isn't it obvious that you can't be happy when you're angry? Mm-hmm. You can't be happy when you're mad. And without when you don't forgive someone and you harbor all this ill will and anger, you're going to be unhappy. And you can't be happy when you're unhappy. Mm. So the act of showing grace and the act of forgiving another person is actually more important for you than it is for the person that you're forgiving because it allows you to let go of all this old animosity and crap that does nothing but make you unhappy and keep you down. And once I understood the value of grace, the value of forgiveness in my own life, 
um, was I able to really reach a, a, a better place in my life as a, as a man, as a, as a husband, as, as, a, as a father, as a business owner, as a coach. And I just think of all the years that I harbored all that anger and ill will that, that caused me to do things and to act in ways that I wish I'd have handled better. Um, once I understood the value and the, and the power of forgiveness and grace, um, I became a better human being for everybody around me and myself, and I, I just wish I'd understood that that lesson far longer, far far before I was 38, 39 years old. That's absolutely powerful. Uh, forgiveness is it's it's essential to being happy. You, you hold it is. On to those it words. absolutely is. Very tough to be happy. Um, I, I, this which is, is, which, by the way, is chapter thirteen of Against the Grain. Absolutely. I mean, that's discussed in 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 detail there. Yeah, I would I would just give my former self a copy of Against the Grain. And say, listen, <laughs> say, <laughs> stop stop doing wrong, start doing right. Let's go. Uh, it, it makes me want to get out there. And trust me, just the act of reading the book, I'm going to participate in the community even more uh, i'm gonna do i'm gonna do better um so I, I feel like i'm already fired up but it's really uh, i want to talk about just food. remember just remember oh, it up? starts in the bedroom in the hallway there's no point in doing a bunch of stuff in society if you're if if everything under your roof isn't right start there and then use that as your branch what start you, there and branch out what do you mean like uh with my family or my my yeah house. absolutely absolutely all of those tenets in that book employ them first with your family employ them first with the people that matter the most to you and then once you've got that base and you've got it under control at home with your mother your father your siblings your wife your children then branch out you, you know too yeah. too often we see people out in society doing these wonderful things and in their churches and their synagogues and everybody thinks they got it all together and they're wonderful and behind closed doors under their roof their their personal life's a wreck and and that's destructive and it, it will never last it always falls apart get your house right and then once your house is right then go take on the world that is not only insightful but it's something i didn't think about and it's probably a humongous mistake that you got to focus in on on family, then work out first. small to big. Family, family first, small to big. That's how you grow. You don't you don't put a roof on a house before you put the walls and the brick up. Uh, do you feel like you've always had your faith? Did you ever question it? Oh, big time. I, I don't think there's a cr- look. Faith is the belief in something that you can't prove, mm-hmm. and and we humans are are just like Missourians. We're show me state type people. Yeah. Um, that's how we're designed. And we we doubt. We we do. Uh, there's not. I don't think there's a Christian in the world who have an. Uh, you you can't be honest and not have had doubts. There's just there's there's no. You, there's I don't know a human being in the world that wouldn't admit having had doubt at their life at, in, in some point. And, and that's why faith is so difficult because we have to put aside our, our natural human predisposition to doubt in order to have faith. But that's also what makes faith so beautiful that you can, you can think in terms of something bigger than yourself. And, and I talk in faith in terms of faith and, and not just religion. I mean, we got to have faith in the institutions that bond us. We have to have faith in a Declaration of Independence, and we have to have faith in a Constitution. Mm-hmm. Th- those are those are thoughts and ideals. They're not concrete. Um, they're not concrete things, and and we have to have faith in something greater than ourselves. Now, a lot of agnostic. I have plenty of friends who are are, are agnostic. But they still have a faith. They have a they have a faith in our country. They have a faith in our legal system. They have a faith in 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 justice. Uh, we all have to have faith in something bigger than ourselves. But as it comes to my faith that you're talking about, my Christianity, sure. I mean, we're 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 intelligent, thinking beings, and and it's hard to to have a faith in something that you can't absolutely prove and put your arms around and hands around and see. 
Um, but and for, and look, I'm not trying to impose this on anybody else. Uh, you know, there's a huge difference in the faithful and in the religious, mm. and I think the religious can be very dangerous. I'm talking about being, but I, I am I am a practicing religious Christian, but I think. I think sometimes religion trumps faith, and when that happens, it's dangerous. Faith first. And, you know, yeah, I've questioned it, but what it comes down to me is that um, too many blessings have happened in my life that have nothing to do with anything that I've earned. And I I look around the world, and I think of the beauty and the wonder in it and, and the amazement of it, and I believe in, in something much greater than myself. And, um, I, you know, I, I look on history and, and I think about Christ and, and, and the, the sacrifices that he made and, and I'm, I'm humbled and, and, and honored to, to, to understand that, that sacrifice. And so, yeah, I, I have doubted it before and I've questioned it before, but I always come back to the same conclusion that for me in my own personal life, just my personal life, for me in my own personal life, um, Christ has been an answer for me. I, I, I feel like it's with a higher power. It also, it empowers you. Uh, and, and it's just a lot of situations where you're just holding on to things. Now you can just let it, kind of go up to God you can well, say do you do you want to know one of the most liberating things in the world yeah about my faith is that I don't answer to a single man on this earth mm. I, I, that's that's something I want so you're you're just there there's the I guess you're releasing that to God it's in God's hands is that I'm not releasing it I'm 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 responsible to it that's okay. a different deal dude I I feel very responsible to um, to my to my faith, okay. and I, I feel very yeah. And um, you know, there's a lot of people that will disagree with me and call me down, and the, all of us get get disagreed with and called down. But I, I don't worry about it because okay. I don't answer to anybody on this on this earth. I like that. I like that a lot. So, what is the future going to hold in the next? You know year two years what do you got planned you got your kids well, I, 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 I speak all over the country and i've got tons of speeches booked out throughout the year and getting more and more inquiries and i take the ones i can take and don't take the other ones i don't take and i run my business every day i'm here now and i, I work day to day running my company mm-hmm. um i've got four kids i still chase around and a, and a pretty wife i gotta keep happy and so i do that um, I shot a pilot for a TV show. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you anything about it except that I have. Um, you know, the book has only been out a month or so, so still doing a lot of book promotion. Um, working on ideas for another book if this one sells well, and um, doing a couple other projects uh, on the on the kind of tv entertainment side of things and and of course i won't do any of them that don't fit with the with the they don't kind of fit into the messaging that we've been talking talking about today and so you know that'll keep me busy and then you never know you never know what develops from one thing leads to another just um you know keep trying to talk about undefeated and not being defeated by your circumstances and keep trying to talk about the tenants and against the grain and and hopefully inspire people to go pick up a copy and actually read it and keep talking and keep running my business and keep being a husband and a father and uh, keep trying to do right and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm personally, this is the book that I'll be gifting to a lot of people because I feel it's so concise, so well thought out. It reads beautifully. Undefeated is just a, such a, a, it's a, it moves the producing of it, uh, the the story behind it, how real it is. It feels, uh, I don't. It feels like I'm there when I watch that documentary. What one thing I want to tell you about Undefeated, and, and most people know it won the Academy Award and mm-hmm. walking the red carpet and all of that was great. And um, actually, that was really pretty cool. And I, sitting in that thing when they called our name out and said Undefeated won, I. I 
that was the most surreal thing in the world. I mean, I, I didn't even hear him say it. I looked at my wife. I said, did we just win? Because we weren't supposed to win. We, hell, it wasn't even supposed to be a movie. But anyway, one thing that, that, that I'd like you and your listeners to know about Undefeated is it is the most unproduced thing you've ever seen. They put a microphone on me, no booms, no satellite trucks, two guys with two small cameras, put a microphone on me and literally followed me around for a year and left Memphis with 560 hours of film and went back and edited for a year to make the, the two hour movie. So what I, and the point I'm trying to make is I was never once asked to say anything. I was never once asked to repeat anything. I was never once asked to stand in a certain place so they could get a shot, nothing. It is in the truest sense of the word, a documentary. They followed us around for a year and then edited and made a movie. So when you are watching it, you are watching something that is real. And to a large degree, I think that's why it won the Academy Award and did so well, is because it is real. It is not like this scripted, produced reality TV stuff. It is truly a documentary with zero production. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Maybe from being on a lot of video shoots, I've met produced as far as like the the quality of cameras the no 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 i know what you meant i just uh, no i get it i just want your listeners to know who watch who have watched it or are going to go watch it just know this isn't one of these reality tv things where stuff is set up it is not and that's what makes it even more compelling to me because in large part these guys caught lightning in a bottle because we had so so many amazing things happen yeah. and then went back and now they did a beautiful job in production and editing putting a a year long story together in a one hour in a two hour format that, that that can actually tell you the story and get you involved and passionate about the story. They did an amazing job. But I just want your listeners and you to know that, you know, that thing is what that thing is. There's nothing in it that's contrived. Yeah. Not one minute. No, no. I, I, you could anybody watching that can realize that. I give that a hundred percent guarantee. That is not. Uh, there's, there's no scripting in there. That is, I, I obviously, uh, you could tell uh, the kids wouldn't be able to. You know, they would be award-winning actors if they could <laughs> take and pull that off. Um, great guys, great film, amazing book. You're making me smile. Just the fact that you're out there. I mean, you're going to send thousands of people. Hopefully, it'll crash your website. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to be following you, and we we couldn't thank you enough for taking the time and really uh, educating us and and leading us in a proper direction. I I really appreciate you having me. And if you could give me two minutes for two seconds for a shameless plug, sure there's tons of updates on all this stuff. You can follow me at. I am Coach Bill on Twitter or at Coach Bill Says on Twitter. And if you want to find out any more about Undefeated or Against the Grain, uh, just go to CoachBillCourtney.com, and there's a, a cool website with everything there and links to uh, speeches and links to Amazon to order it. And I just hope we can drive your listeners there and get them to kind of jump on the bandwagon and get to be part of this 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 idea this thought process that we're trying to get started yeah that's the one good thing about our listeners is they invest in themselves they look at buying a book especially when you're it's relatively inexpensive to buy a book and yep. if you, you pull one idea away from it that book was invaluable so I, I think you're guys out there ladies out there I want a huge bump up crash the site I want them to get so crazy they're buying lumber from you which I'm about to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rebuild my whole house. Uh, that's great. All right, buddy. I appreciate it very much. All right. Well, you uh, will keep in touch, and uh, we can't thank you enough. Sounds great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.